So I'm going to give you a short talk about some of the work we have been doing at the University of Bath over the last two and a half, three years on, in the fields of ethics and safety. You're probably here because you either read or you actually experienced one of these headlines, how AI is changing the world. And in extent, it may even be changing what we mean by being human. We are, have been using AI to tackle down hard problems such as uh, cancer detection, drug discovery. It's changing the way we do science, businesses. I've been hearing human resources managers on using AI nowadays to reach out to candidates for jobs that otherwise they would be overlooked. AI has changed the world. Yet, if you enter a room like this one, and you see this robot around, how many of you are afraid of this machine? Can you raise your hands if you, think that you, are, if you feel afraid of the robot? How many of you find it cute? Okay, three, four hands, yay. How many of you are, think that you can understand what the robot is doing in this video. Can you make a guess? Whoever raised your hands, can you make a loud guess? Uh, is it trying to find the so the robot is actually built by my co-author Robert Wortham, who's at the back over there, and it just uses a micro, an Arduino microcontroller. It costs less than 50 pounds to build, and it just uses a heat detector to go around and fight any heat signatures. The moment it fights the heat signatures, it instantly assumes that that's a human. This results in a number of false positives and false negatives as well. We actually sent this video to 20 people, including some of them with computer science and robotics backgrounds, and they couldn't understand what it was doing either. And instead, they came up with all, all sorts of different explanations, often attributed too much complexity into what the robot is actually being able to do. Why? It's because we humans were not able, were not equipped with genetic or cultural evolution to deal with machine agency. We model each other, we understand each other thanks to similarity, and we extend that to animals. So for example, we extend our own actuators, our hands and legs to dogs or ex and, and other animals. We extend our own internal motives to animals. And this way, if we see a dog going around the room like that, we know that either the dog is frightened and wants to leave the room, or it's being playful. And we'd be right in that it's one of those two scenarios. But when it comes to AI, which afforded the capacity to fake that similarity, we have no idea what's going on. And to make things even more complicated, you can have the same machines, but program in different ways. So we end up making our own theory of mind, our own narratives, based on our own beliefs, which are often, are often influenced by media, popular media, or even science fiction. In short, we end up just making things up, and that can make us all vulnerable users. And going back to a panel discussion that was yesterday regarding Sophia, the anthropomorphic robot, there was an argument how Sophia has its head open at the back, and that's fine because this way you still know that that's a robot, but look at this machine we had here. You can see all the wires popping out, and yet people were not able to understand what it was doing. They were attributing too much complexity and intelligence to it, let alone to a robot that looks exactly like us. So that has been the motivation behind a three years long research program that we've been doing at the University of Bath, where we are arguing that we shouldn't be using AI just as a black box that we just place there, use it, and get it over with. Instead, we should make AI transparent. But what is transparency? On its own, it sounds quite vague. And when I started my PhD in 2015, it was. But I'm a computer scientist. I like requirements. I like checkboxes that I can just tick and say, OK, I've done the job today. Some people were arguing back then that just provide the source code or a really huge manual, that's enough. But for me, that's just a way to shift the responsibility from us to the RN users. And I really don't want to teach my grandparents how to code just to understand where the Roomba stops working whenever it goes under the couch. So what we did in 2016, and later on we revised that manuscript and resubmitted in 2017, is make a definition for transparency. And that is that the, that the decision-making mechanism of a robot should be exposed and provide on-demand 
accurate interpretations of its status, environmental perception, and in reliability, unexpected behavior, and error messages. And actually, this is a definition we have been pushing to a number of standard, uh, standardizations and legislation initiatives on AI, which I'm going to talk towards the end of this talk. So how do we actually make agents transparent? That's a good question. And it's actually really hard to answer, because we have all these different types of agents from swarm robotics to robots for children with autism. We even have like we, different usages. Again, from robotics to image classification and so on, it's really hard to, fi to figure out how we do that. Because there is simply not one solution for everything. But we developed one solution, and that is Apollo 3. Apollo 3 allows not only the creation of reactive plans, reactive planning is a way to develop intelligent agents, but it also allows a real-time transparency feed and interpretation of that feed from the agent to allowing the developer to understand what's going on inside the machine in real time. But it's not only that it's novelty, it also allows an abstraction information. So instead of having all this huge tree that if you're not a developer, you'll probably not make much sense of, you can just have a high-level overview of what's going on. And we actually shown this video to 20 users, to 20 end users, alongside with the first one, and we asked them a series of questions. Do you think the robot is thinking? Rate one to five if they think that the robot is intelligent. And some other questions to test their model model accuracy. We compare the results. And we found that people who had access to Apollo 3 had much better mental model accuracy. In fact, there was a statistical significant difference between the two groups. And another thing that actually provoked some discussions within my lab was about the, the, if the robot is thinking or not. People who had access to Apollo 3 were more likely to say that the robot is thinking. And I think that goes back to the, what we define as thinking. Because for quite a few of them, for, for, sorry, for quite a few of us, it's much, something a bit more philosophical, it's something much more a biological process. For me, I would say thinking is just the decision making when uh, you go through until you make a decision, which by definition is actually cognition, real time search. So in, in essence, by having access to this real time transparency, actually showed people how the robot is cognitive. And we actually replicated this study once again at the at Bristol Science Museum. And this time we had people in person interacting with the robot. And again, there was much better meta model accuracy on people who had access to Apollo 3. Having said that, my co-author Robert Wortham dressed up his robot, making it a bit more zoomorphic to deliberately deceive users. And again, he used various means of transparency that is in the form of Apollo 3 and the muttering robot, which is vocalization. You can see the results. Again, people who had access to any sort of transparency feed had much better metal model accuracy. And that is something that you can see in his thesis that is going to be made available at Path's open access portal at the end of this month. So our research has shown that any poor transparency allows robots to mislead us. And human-computer interaction studies show how any misunderstanding can lead to misuse or even disuse which is exactly the opposite effect of when you have good transparency, allowing to calibrate trust. Just when to trust the machine or lose confidence in real time. And I think we already had a couple of deaths from self-driving cars because the passenger in the car put too much trust to the machine. So that, okay, the machine is working fine, so the passenger was not paying any attention to the road. And we already had a couple of deaths thanks to that. But this is actually part of the research project that Holly Wilson, who's over there, is working on. Holly is an MSc student and who, under my supervision, is exploring in recreating some moral dilemmas in virtual reality. We've been using it over July and August to test how people perceive these moral dilemmas if they were made by humans compared to the ones made by opaque machines and transparent machines. If you're interested, actually, in taking part in this study, please drop me an email. My email is at the end of the slides. All of this software is not just being used for research, but also for teaching. In fact, this year we have incorporated into our Intelligent Cognitive Control Systems Unit, which is our final year, an MSc level AI course at the University of Bath, both about three and Bang. Bang is a video game that we developed, which allows students to create small teams of five agents each and compete against each other in a capsule the flag tournament. And at the end, they have also to produce a report. And in the report, quite a few students noted down how great Apollo 3 was for, their, for the development of their agents. In fact, I'm, I'm, I found quite interesting the last comment in this slide. 
upholstery was very useful for inspecting the often unexpected ways in which these simple behaviors were combined to produce higher level behaviors. And that's, particular, and that's quite frightening in many ways because it shows how even us, the actual developers who develop these machines, sometimes we just don't understand what they are doing and why they are doing so. Because don't forget agents, by definition, they interact with each other, they interact with the environment, and they have this emerging behavior coming out, which is over hard to understand, which is why we have been arguing in favor of transparency. Because this way it will allow not only the end users calibrate trust, but also as the developers debug our agents. And in fact, we ran a survey afterwards, and we found that people who had a, uh, students who had access to Apollo 3 this year were not only happy with Apollo 3 as a debugging tool, but actually they believe that it helped them understand POSH, which is an actual selection mechanism we have been teaching them, but also natural intelligence, and, and eventually to develop their agents faster. Having said that, we are now working on another project with Apollo 3, Alexander Zorotidis, who is actually at the back over there. He has been working on importing Apollo 3 in augmented reality. So by the end of this summer, you'll be able to point your Android phone on robots and get the Apollo 3 visualization of a, of a robot and get the real-time transparency feed coming from the robot into Apollo 3 on the screen of your own smartphone. All of this work actually raised our international profile, an AXA research fund, gave us one of their three research grants last year, to, and more specifically to Joanna Bryson, my supervisor, and PI of this project. And we are working now by the end of this year to make all of our software open source, and that includes Apollo 3 for papers. So you'll be able to use Apollo 3 to develop plans in essentially program paper, but also to debug paper in real time. And we're gonna make Apollo 3 available to download and use on the built-in tablets that papers have. Having said this, how do we actually get companies to agree and implement transparency? Well, every time there's a new emerging technology, if there is any lack of understanding, it can always lead to fear and mistrust by the general public. And it usually requires a huge campaign of marketing, PR, public policy, and so on to make the public adopt that technology. For example, the elevators that we all know and maybe love, that you just go into the elevator, press floor number three, and takes you to the third floor. They actually were invented in the beginning of the 19th century, but they only became available widely spread in around 50 years afterwards. Why? Because people were afraid when they first came out, A, of, for their own safety, that they're gonna get stuck without an operator pressing the button to get to the next floor, and that people were gonna lose their jobs. This reminds me exactly the last year's Eurobarometer about AI, where again, people were actually positive. They had some positive view for robots, the majority of, of, of respondents across the whole European Union, but still, there is even greater amount of people who actually are afraid that it's gonna steal people's job, and that they believe that any robotics technology requires careful management, which makes it essential to address any ethical, legal, societal, and economical issues way in advance. Because you can actually break that circle by having the public policy in place to ensure public trust. Otherwise, we may end up, as in, with the elevators example, having to wait 50 years until someone, some policymakers getting annoyed because the operators were not strike and they had to climb across thousands of stairs in New York and Washington DC to make public policy. And this has been, and the recently GM crisis that we had in Europe actually inspired quite a few organizations, including some in Britain, to start working on legislation and standards. And this includes the parliament, the old party parliamentary group, which actually proposed recently on the AI, on the AI global governance initiative. And there are quite a few standards and initiatives as well, such as the IEEE, the BSI, and ISO, who are working on standards. And we at the University of Bath, we have been contributing to those standards already, and we are making sure that all of our research goes directly into the hands of those policymakers, including ourselves as in quite a few of these committees. But the major thing that we should always keep in mind that none of these standards are addressing these, the robots. They are all addressing us, the developers, because at the end of the day, we are the ones that can be held accountable and responsible when things go wrong, which is why, I've, 
thankfully, every time there's a standard or policy nowadays initiative, we always have been talking about accountability, responsibility, and transparency. Transparency to make sure that the right people can be held accountable. Responsibility, who can be held responsible across the whole spectrum. And that includes even us, the developers, maybe our users, maybe the, co the companies that develop them, and the, the testers, and so on. But also accountability, because sometimes accountable and responsible are two different concepts in, in legal terms. So you may be held responsible, but not directly accountable. In conclusion, there is no one-size-fits-all solution in, a, in transparency. But we have been working with various solutions, which includes visualization, vocalization, and so on. And transparency has already shown how it helps people, users adjust their expectations and trust, but also developers to debug their own agents. Because creating AI is one thing, but creating responsible AI is another. Which is why we should always be thinking in terms of accountability, responsibility, and transparency. Having said all of this, I would like to thank the rest of my research groups and an amazing list of co-authors, because I wouldn't be here without them. So thank you.